Welcome, everyone. Please have a seat. All right. I think uh, it's 1340, so uh, that means we can get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher van der Maade, um, and today we'll do a little bit of a different session than I've seen so far at the event. A um, little bit of a different twist, but uh, definitely very much related to uh, a lot of the sessions. So today we'll talk about um, how security and statistics are sometimes friends, sometimes not. Uh, and we'll specifically have a look at the effect of false positives um, in, in the security space and what effect they have on automation. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm half Dutch, explaining my last name, half American, explaining my first name, uh, but I was born and raised in the Netherlands. Uh, maybe you can detect my accent uh, from the Netherlands, I'm not sure. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I work for Cisco. Um, I've joined uh, there in 2015 as an associate systems engineer. I was then actually in the Nordics team as a consulting systems engineer for uh, our security product. Um, and yeah, actually I visited uh, Scandinavia and, and Norway and Sweden, et cetera, uh, as well. Um, I was then a software engineer for a, a few years, but currently I'm a uh, engineering product manager uh, focusing on uh, our, uh, the automation of our extended detection and response um, platform. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in, in uh, hearing more about that, then uh, I'll obviously stick, stick around at the end a little bit. Um, I have a lot of hobbies. Um, eating, notorious one. So uh, luckily I was able to lose some weight again, but uh, I really like cooking and uh, uh, anything related to food. Um, the agenda for today starts a little bit of a bright slide. Uh, I hope everyone's uh, awake now after lunch. Uh, There's uh, four topics. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, it's a little bit of a different um, angle that, that I'm taking today. So I'm looking a little bit more from the security operations uh, angle, whereas, yeah, obviously a lot of the talks are very uh, developer focused. Don't worry, uh, we'll obviously have a look at some code as well, because the idea is uh, I wanna talk about how to automate as much as possible in, in this space. We'll talk about that second, so, but don't worry, won't be a statistics class. Uh, I'm also not some kind of a math pro professor. I just wanna lay out a couple of actually pretty simple concepts uh, around false positives and how they impact um, security detections. Um, we'll then make it concrete. I uh, usually like to make a, a, it concrete with an actual use cases uh, that are more of a real world e example. Um, we'll do a demo there as well um, and uh, we'll end with some conclusions. Now, if you have any questions throughout the session, please just raise your hands. I noticed that a lot of times the questions come at the end, but uh, I'd rather have you just ask the question. Let's see how it goes. If there's too many, then maybe we need to, uh, to rate limit that. But um, if you have a question, just ask. Otherwise, I'm worried you may forget uh, till the end or w whatever. Okay, so let's kick it off. Um, I want to open with this statement, which is that there's two ways to view automation. It can be a potential weak link, and a lot of people, a lot of uh, um, organizations that I speak with, they often view automation as a kind of a, as a risk. They don't want to automate too much because they're afraid they might make a decision which uh, was, uh, for example, false positive, and they do something very rigorous and um, uh, potentially uh, uh, disconnect the laptop of the CEO or something like that. Um, but others view it also as an enabler um, to streamline your security operations. And again, we're talking a little bit about security operations uh, here today. So the question is, is your glass half full or half empty uh, about this? And there it goes. Um, let's see if it sticks around. 
Um, so at the end, I'll come back to this statement, and I'm curious whether your opinion may have changed uh, about this. And uh, don't worry if it doesn't make sense, we'll, we'll get into more detail soon. All right, so let's get started. So first, I want to talk about threat hunting and incident response. These are two classic security operations uh, that probably every organization uh, must undertake. Uh, not every organization actually does it. Um, so you see that a lot of organizations, they do some form of incident response. If there's a security event or some kind of alert, they will look at it and uh, they may act on it. Threat hunting is something else. A lot of organizations don't even do that. So if I ask here, I don't know how many people there are, like uh, a few dozen. If I ask what threat hunting is, probably we'll have uh, the amount of people or the amount of expla explanations is, will be the same as uh, the amount of people. People usually view it as something uh, different. It's actually not that exciting. It sounds very mystical sometimes, but it's actually not. Uh, threat hunting is the process of proactively and iteratively searching through environments to detect and isolate advanced threats that evaded your existing security solutions. So it's important here to note the things that I underlined. You're proactively going out and you're, you have, maybe have a hypothesis. I think I'm attacked by this new log4j vulnerability. Um, I'm going to find out if I'm attacked. Sort of the reverse of incident response. Um, and it's also important that usually your hypothesis states, I think that even though I have security solutions protecting me, I think I'm already infected. So you're, you're sort of assuming that they've evaded your, uh, your existing security solutions. Uh, obviously, a lot of people in the room know what it is, but now we sort of know what, what, uh, what we mean in the, this context of the session. Now, there's a couple types of hunting that you can do. Uh, Intelligence-driven hunting is usually quite simple. Um, here, you're looking for atomic indicators. Atomic indicators are, uh, yeah, literally, uh, as they mentioned, it can be like a process or an IP address or a domain name, something you know that is bad, and you go and look, find in your logs and all of your monitoring tools whether you're able to find one of those atomic indicators of compromise. Then there's TTP-driven. TTP, -driven. TTP uh, stands for Tactics, Techniques, and Procedures. Ah, nice, written it down. Um, and, and this is more difficult. Uh, you do know what you're looking for, but you're not looking for one specific thing. You're looking for a technique or a type of attack. So you're looking for behavior. It's a little bit more difficult. Uh, but again, you do know what you're looking for. The last type of threat hunting is anomaly driven. Uh, this is the most difficult one because you actually don't know what you're looking for. You're just on the lookout for abnormal behavior and uh, you try to find these low prevalence artifacts. So things that uh, yeah, uh, are not that common and all of a sudden you see it or some kind of outlying behavior. Now, um, as I mentioned, a lot of organizations are not actually doing any type of threat hunting, which is a shame because, uh, yeah, as mentioned, uh, you have all kinds of cool security solutions, but you can bet, uh, you can bet that uh, attackers are smarter and smarter, and I don't have to tell the people in the room here, and that they can invade those solutions. So you want to go proactively find uh, things. Now, these two, are usually require humans, as I like to say. So you need to use your brains to actually think of how to search for this. This is less easy to automate. But intelligence-driven hunting is actually quite simple. You have a list of items you know are bad. You just go and search for them. That is something you qu can quite easily automate. Uh, I hope people here in the room uh, um, agree. So, intelligence-driven threat hunting. Let's see if we can automate that today. And, uh, and all the code and everything that I'll show, by the way, will obviously be available. Um, now, basically, intelligence-driven threat hunting 
is lo sh um, combining local context with global intelligence. So you have your logs, your monitoring tools and everything. You, you have a list of stuff that's bad. Well, let's cross-reference the two and see if any um, correlations come out of that. If so, you usually have quite actionable insights and you can take action immediately. You know this machine or this host has made contact to some kind of command and control server uh, or, or whatever, and you're able to quite quickly contain the threat. Um, now this cross-referencing sounds very easy, but anyone here who has ever worked in a security operation center uh, probably knows that it's more difficult than it sounds. Uh, one of the important things is you need to be able to compare apples with apples. And uh, not all of this is in the sa uh, written down in the same data model or maybe even language. Or, uh, and that's why it's sometimes difficult to compare the two. Well, it may look something like this. You could have uh, uh, a actually observed um, connection to an IP address. And here you may have an actual judgment about that IP address. For example, that it's malicious. Um, it's something bad. Uh, if you have your application server, uh, some kind of host in there that made a connection to that, well, that's probably a bad thing. Now, uh, I assume everyone here knows SANS. Um, so uh, SANS has done a lot of work around threat hunting and uh, incident response. And um, uh, they actually have a, a pretty good model. If you want uh, the research article, you can scan a QR code. But if you, you, uh, you look uh, closely, you see that feedback is very important in their model. An important thing here is that whatever you do, so when you're doing threat hunting, it's kind of like a circular um, thing that you do, as you see with those arrows. But feedback is very important. And we'll get to that later when we talk about false positives. It's really important to tune your threat hunting while you're doing it. Um, we can probably spend more time on this, but uh, we, we don't have time for that today, obviously. They also, SENSE also has a threat hunting maturity model, which is quite interesting. We also don't, won't go through all of the steps here. But it's interesting that level zero relies primarily on automated alerting. Uh, they have little or no routine data collection. But if you look at level four, the most advanced level, the fifth level, you see that um, they automate the majority of their successful data analysis procedures. So it seems that if you start automating with those kind of things, you actually uh, become quite a higher level. And you may ask, who cares what level I am? More and more, um, what you see is that, for example, insurance companies offer cybersecurity insurances, and they sometimes look at these kind of levels of maturity to def decide uh, what kind of insurance uh, money you have to pay. So um, being mature, obviously, is a good thing, um, uh, not just because you're finding attacks, but also uh, money-wise. Okay, so that was threat hunting. Now let's talk about instant response. Instant response is the monitoring and detection of security events, which we're trying to find with threat hunting, and it's the execution of proper responses to those events. Now you may ask yourself, what is a security event? Like when do we call something a security event? And what then is an incident? These are terms that are used quite interchangeably, uh, quite often. Um, but uh, a security event is an occurrence that might lead to a breach. And an incident is usually uh, when you have confirmed it, there is an actual breach. And if you dumb it down, usually a security incident means you need to call the legal department because probably you have a breach in your organization. So that's usually when uh, uh, you better call Saul for people that know the series, uh, very good series. Um, so yeah, so usually there is a big difference between a security event and an incident. That's the bottom line here. Now again, SANS uh, has a model for this as well. Um, you can scan the QR code again if you're not familiar with this 
um, this model, but basically they have a model that you go through uh, when you're doing instant response. The most important one here, I guess, is the identification, is where you decide this is not just a, um, a security event anymore. We know now this is an incident. You've done your research, f collected extra context, and you can confirm uh, that uh, shit hit the fan, basically. Um, but obviously in the other steps then is to contain the threat, eradicate the threat. Um, that usually sometimes involves like uh, re-imaging a, a machine, etc. And then recovery is when you put everything back into production. Now, lessons learned here, again, is very important that you provide feedback to your system um, and that you tune all of your operations. Um, uh, I, people that are familiar with MITRE attack framework, I assume a lot of people know it, uh, less known is the React um, framework, so you have the attack framework and then the React. Uh, React is actually sort of based on the MITRE attack framework, but they have for these SANS phases decided what kind of actions you need to do, and they have mapped this also to the MITRE attack framework. So when you get attacked, you know, oh, okay, it's this type of MITRE attack, and then this framework will tell you what to do to actually clean it up. Um, so this is uh, quite a good framework, in my opinion. I'm uh, quite a big fan of it. Uh, everything is obviously open to use, and uh, you can scan it there, but uh, you can also quite easily find it on, uh, on Google. Now, who has time to do any of this? That's my question. I talked a lot already, um, but yeah, we're not really concrete yet, and it's all talk about processes, but I think everyone here in the room knows there's not enough people to do this kind of work. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of organizations are not doing this kind of work, so nobody actually has time for it. So this is maybe where some automation can help. So that brings us to the next topic, automation and statistics. Now, um, I, I feel that automation is an underutilized um, tool in security operations centers. Um, and I think everyone here, are, you're either in a developer or you work in uh, the security space or both, uh, that we can really make a difference here to start doing that more and uh, give this uh, poor, uh, poor robot some, some work, some oil. Um, so automation, again, quite easy to understand what it is. If you look at the definition, uh, it is to reduce human intervention in processes. Hey, and it's predetermining the decision criteria and sub-process relationships. Now, this is quite interesting. Basically, what this means is that we're, in Dutch, we have a saying, you pre-chew something for somebody. We're basically pre-chewing the information, setting relationships and contexts, and uh, by doing so, reduce the amount of human uh, work needed. Now here I have um, outlined a very simple building blocks of automation. You have a trigger for your automation, maybe an alarm clock. You have input, it's the date and time. You have some conditions. If it's Monday and it's eight o'clock, well, take some actions, order coffee, fetch your first meeting. Maybe you do that via the Starbucks and the Outlook API. And then finally, you can print out a coffee pickup location and your first meeting details. Um, now, this is a, a simple automation. If we put it in a security context, then the trigger may be there's a new security detection or a security event. The input are the details of that detection. And then your condition might be if this attack has a certain severity or confidence, uh, etc., then we go and take some actions. For example, quarantine or isolate hosts. Um, maybe we, we even kill. Uh, some part of our application or uh, some part of our network uh, because we feel like an actual attack is going on. Now, you're able to automate this quite easily, but as I mentioned, people are usually scared of doing so. That is because there's two things here, the trigger and the conditions, which could have a false positive. Maybe actually the security detection was, there was nothing going on, 
or your conditions are set too loose. So you're taking actions too quickly um, and you don't have a good um, condition there. So this is where it gets um, in interesting with regards to t statistics. Now we have the concept of false positives and false negatives. Um, it's probably quite simple, uh, but they are also so sometimes called a type one or type two error. For example, you can tell this uh, old man that he's pregnant, or which obviously probably is not true. And um, you could also tell a pregnant person uh, that they're not pregnant. This is a false negative. A very important distinction, and it's very important to keep this in mind when you start automating, that we're pretty sure that it's actually a true positive. So false positives in cybersecurity are mislabeled security alerts, indicating that there's a threat when actually there's nothing going on. Um, and obviously, this increases noise for already overworked security teams. Often, it's quite funny, it's easier to prove the opposite of your hypothesis is false rather than that uh, your hypothesis is true. So it's easier to say uh, that you are not um, attacked than to prove that you're actually attacked. Uh, because, yeah, that's sometimes uh, easier to test. Now, a brief history on false positives. Um, uh, actually, in World War II, they were actually already working on this, um, where uh, radar engineers tried to detect the enemy um, on a radar, probably a very old school radar system, and they actually had a lot of uh, problems with false positives. Uh, they called the sensitivity of a test a true positive rate. A true positive meaning uh, we've detected that we are attacked and you are actually attacked. And specificity is the true negative rate, meaning s the test says you are not attacked, and that is actually true. Now, um, and it might be silly to have a look at these basic concepts, but it is quite interesting um, to keep this in mind when you're doing automation, uh, that you're keeping these to a good uh, level. Um, and what is interesting is that the rarer an event, so the rarer your attack, the chance of being attacked, the bigger the impact of a false positive rate becomes. For example, if 0.01% of the time an actual security event occurs, but you have a false positive uh, rate of 1%, that means that your team gets 100 alerts for every actual alert, which is a big problem because your team will probably investigate every alert that comes in, or they should be doing that. Um, here, just a funny uh, one also to point out how it works. Suppose that you have a test that can say uh, how, uh, if you're allergic to cats, yes or no. Um, and um, the test uh, that 80% um, or wait, you have uh, the test saying 80% uh, of the time yes when you actually have an allergy, but it says 20% no. Um, so 20 of the uh, percent of the time, the test will say no, but you actually have the allergy. And 10% of the time, it will say uh, yes when you don't have it. Now, these numbers look pretty good. 80% says yes when you actually have the allergy. Now, suppose that 1% of the population has the allergy, and, and the test says yes for Alice. What are the chances that Alice really has this allergy? Now, we won't go through all the calculations, right now, but actually you will be surprised. Um, there's a, an easy trick which you may want to use when, whenever you see percentages. Just do everything times a thousand and it makes it easier to calculate. But in this case you can see that uh, when, you do, when you calculate this out, you see that there's only 7% chance she actually has the allergy. So the, here you see the impact of a seemingly Decent false positive rate, 80 versus 20, uh, but actually this is what the result uh, will be. And these are, yeah, this is not a good percentage, again, if you're going to have so many false positives. A better way of doing it is with Bayes theory. 
And um, this is more for your reference. But obviously, these calculations you can do quite easily um, in an automated way with a simple script that uh, implements Bayes theory. Um, and the same would come out here. Bayes theory is just a statistical um, formula that takes the chance of something else into approach. So the chance you have the allergy given, that means that pipe uh, line, that the test says yes. And obviously, the same comes out. Now, this might be a good job for our automation uh, here. OK, now let's get back to um, some more important stuff. What is a common trigger for false positives? It could be that your security detections have a low confidence rate, so uh, that, that it's uh, alerting on things that it's not that sure about. Software bugs. I'm not sure who was yesterday in the session uh, where we take a look at the GitHub Copilot, uh, but poorly written software with bugs, uh, which can sometimes be the actual um, uh, the, the trigger to that can be that it's automated automated code generation. Um, but that, that can definitely trigger false positives as well. Um, unrecognized network traffic, be on the lookout for that. Or maybe uh, some kind of legitimate cleaning tool that someone has downloaded that's deleting old shadow copies, uh, which would then trigger uh, a similar alert for uh, because that's behavior ransomware does, even though it is legitimate. So, um, and uh, finally, legitimate files maybe with missing security certificates, they could also be flagged as malicious. So all of these are uh, common triggers for false positives in security. Here's some interesting research um, that stated that 45% of all alerts are actually false positives, um, but that 75% of organizations spend the same amount of time on these false positives. So this is just a giant, giant waste of time. And false positives uh, often cause the same amount of downtime as an actual attack, because uh, the, the, maybe there's a junior incident responder that doesn't know it's a false positive, starts locking down parts of your network or of your, of your data center um, because they want to be uh, rather safe than sorry. But downtime actually also causes a lot of problems, as probably everyone knows. So this is also so quite interesting. But there's some light at the end of the tunnel. There are things you can do, and we'll have a look at that in just a little bit. Um, you can reduce the, the size of your threat surface. That's an obvious one. The, the smaller the chance that you get attacked, um, smaller the chance of a false positive, pretty much. Um, but you need, uh, more importantly, adjust the alert threshold and prioritize alerts based on all kinds of context. Enrich your security detections uh, with as much context as possible. And improve enterprise-wide cybersecurity hygiene. Make sure you patch your systems, uh, etc. And most importantly, make sure that you're learning from, if you detect a false positive, don't just go on to the next one. Make sure you're tuning your system so that it doesn't happen again. So, this is the quick lesson here that we can take from math. Uh, so who, who would have thought that uh, math, at least I thought it is a little bit interesting uh, and not the most boring topic ever. Uh, but thanks, I don't see a lot of people sleeping yet. So that's a, a good sign, I guess. Um, so nobody has time for it. So that means uh, we need to automate this. So let's do that. So let's have a look at a concrete use case. Um, and um, to do that, um, we can first, so there will be two concrete use cases. One, I wanted to automate something around threat hunting. And then afterwards, we'll uh, take a look at instant response. How can you automate the actual instant response? And uh, I hope that people in the room find it interesting either because they might do stuff like this in their day-to-day -day job. Um, or maybe they want to develop uh, something for other organizations that can help them 
with this. Um, and if you're just a developer, it's good to know what the security team actually has to go through as well um, um, with the code that you're writing. Um, suppose that something goes wrong. So the first one is a Twitter threat hunting um, exercise. And um, you may ask, hmm, Twitter, what, what, uh, what can you find there? But actually, there's a lot of interesting threat intelligence to be found on Twitter, probably also on Twitter alternatives currently. But uh, the time I made this use case, there uh, wasn't uh, such a thing yet. Um, now, remember the practical threat hunt model. Um, if you write that down, and you can see here I have an icon which is you, where a human is needed, person with a hoodie, and some kind of a gear wheel is easy to automate. Now, obviously, most steps in the threat hunt model from SANS are something a human does, because you're actually creating a plan on what to do. Uh, so what are you threat hunting? What, are you do what sources are you using, etc. But actually, conducting the hunt can very easily be done with a script. Now, uh, let's get back to the Twitter threat hunt. Now, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to search Twitter, uh, and we're going to look for a specific hashtag that uh, security researchers use, uh, called hashtag open there. I'm not sure if people know it. There are a couple of other of these hashtags, like hashtag phishing, hashtag malware, but a lot of people use them to post new, really fresh uh, IOCs that they find. Uh, you can look it up. It's quite interesting. And we're going to grab those. And our hypothesis is going to be, I think I'm attacked by one of these new fresh malware that has been found. And you're going to look in your organization whether that's true. And uh, one thing to decrease the amount of false positives is that uh, we're going to check. So we're not just going to blindly take everything that's on there. Um, we're going to check a couple of threat intelligence sources like VirusTotal and a couple of others to check if any of those um, indicators or observables, as, as we sometimes call them, is marked clean. If it's hard-coded marked clean, that uh, usually is a, is a sign that it's not bad. Uh, it might sound a little bit controversial, but if a, a trustworthy threat intelligence source marks something as clean, it usually is. And let me just tell you from experience, if you don't ignore those kind of uh, domain names or IP addresses or whatever, you're going to get a lot of noise. Because uh, yeah, um, if you're going to m create alerts for, uh, uh, for legitimate software, that's not going to work. Now, what we're going to do is we're going on a, we're, uh, I've created a script, um, a Python script, that's every hour going to pull the Twitter API for the specific um, um, hashtag. And again, it's quite easy to change. Parse those tweets, see, hey, are there any cool, fresh indicators of compromise here? If so, it's going to check your local, your local monitoring systems to see if you have any device or machine or host that actually made a connection uh, to it. Um, now, to do this, I'm going to use two open source um, tools that have been developed by Cisco. Uh, one is called the Cisco Threat Intel API, and the other one is CTIM, Cisco Threat Intel Model. This is uh, basically a, um, well, it says there, it's an operationalized threat intel service. This is a data model. The idea of this is that you're translating all of your different sources of information into the same data model, and this API allows you to do so. Now, both, again, are open source. Feel free to use them uh, as you wish. Um, and in a nutshell, what they're doing is this. So CTIA is that API that I was talking about, which is open source um, uh, license, I think, or clips or something. But uh, you can find them on GitHub, and you can do with it with what you want. For those that are familiar with Stix Taxi, this is a simplified version. Um, OK, 
So what are we doing? We're going to grab uh, the last 100 tweets with the hashtag OpenDeer. Uh, unless we ran already, then it's only going to grab the new tweets, obviously. If there are no tweets, it's going to sleep. We're going to run this every hour. I'll go a little bit quickly through this, so we'll see the demo in a bit. Now, then we'll, uh, we're going to parse the tweets one by one. We're going to use some regex to retrieve IOCs only from the tweet. For example, IP addresses, domain names, file hashes, whatever. Um, then, if there are any IOCs, um, we're going to check them using this uh, API that I was talking about before. And again, this API allows you to pull in all different types of sources of information, threat intelligence, but also your local monitoring systems and translates it into the same data model so that you can very easily do cross-references between the two. Um, now, if you actually have uh, a local monitoring system telling you, yes, I've seen this IOC, and actually I haven't just seen it uh, anywhere, but I've seen it coming from a device or a host, um, then we're going to add a security event to the so-called, I call it myself, correlation queue, uh, which will uh, come back later. Otherwise, we're going to skip it. We're going to keep doing that for every tweet, and we're going to do that every hour for every new tweet, and just until the end of time. And if there's nothing, we'll sleep for an hour and then keep doing it. Now, um, what you've seen here is actually uh, this atomic type of intelligence-driven threat hunting from a source that probably people don't use every day, Twitter, uh, to do threat hunts, and it's completely automated. You don't have to do anything. We're checking all kinds of threat intel sources. We're making sure it's not a false positive, and only if we're really sure something is going on, that's when we're going to create a security event. And um, then we can hand it over to a human, and that human can then validate what's going on. So this skips many steps and brings people to a quite mature threat hunting level. Uh, and yeah, you don't have to do anything. So that's quite nice. Usually people like not doing stuff. Um, so if we take this small Twitter module, we can make a lot of other modules. Maybe there are blog posts where we can grab information from. Uh, maybe there are uh, other social media where we want to scrape IOCs from. So we can have all kinds of sources of fresh, fresh IOCs. We then use our tool to see if there's any detections with a target. So that means there was an actual host or device or some kind of asset in our organization that had uh, contact with it. We can also use our boring security tools that may actually generate an alert. All of that we can put in a target correlation queue. And there we can actually go and decide, hey, are there actually more security events for one specific asset? And then we can decide, is this an easy incident, yes or no? And obviously then the green thing is we can automate our incident response. OK, so I went a little bit quick, but I want to make sure we can also uh, spend time on uh, the demo. <clears throat> now, uh, obviously, you can't have a presentation anymore without some kind of chat GBT reference. Um, so uh, I actually asked also whether chat GBT could do a demo for me. It was actually a really good demo. Uh, my demo is a little bit different because I use Twitter, uh, but it's actually uh, surprisingly good. When I asked if they can do it for me, obviously, it said, no, I'm sorry, I can't do a live demo for you. So that's uh, the best next thing is me. So I'll do the demo then. So um, this is Twitter. Um, and what I've done is I'm searching for the hashtag, um, whoops, hashtag open deer, as you can see. Now, what you can see is that people like Emiliano here, Carlesi, is uh, posted today, hey, I found a thread on this. URL, hashtag phishing, hashtag open there. Uh, below, we've got Petrovic, 
an IP address, hashtag open there. This is usually command and control. As you can see, they did sort of, I um, uh, forgot, forgot the word now, but they made it so that you can't click on it. So it's not clickable. They did HXXP. Uh, this is a common way of uh, uh, defanging your, uh, your IOCs, similarly like the square brackets around uh, the, the point. Yes? Good question. So here, uh, this is an ad, I think. Sorry about that. So uh, the question was, how do we know if this is a false positive or not? Maybe it's some kind of a troll trying to mess uh, with this hashtag um, and putting some kind of uh, maybe an IP address of the server of a competitor on there because they want that to be blocked. Um, so this is where um, the CTIA comes in. What I'm doing, and I'll show you that in a little bit, is I'm taking these and I'm checking a couple of trusted sources of threat intel. Virus Total is one uh, and a couple of others. Um, and it's up to you what you want to add to this CTIA uh, instance. And if there is a source, which I trust as an organization, which says this is clean, so this is not bad, um, I ignore them. And uh, the reason why I'm doing that is exactly because we don't want those false positives. So we don't want something legitimate to accidentally trigger an alert. And otherwise, it will cause a lot of noise. If it's marked unknown, suspicious, or obviously malicious, then we continue. Um, and um, yeah, so basically, we're trusting a little bit on our threat intel sources and whether they hard coded or, well, specifically marked something as clean. That's the way to do it. Yes? So, so you are judging it based on the sender, not the content, right? So the source, not the content of the source, not only the message? Correct. Correct. So technic So I'm, uh, the question was, so you're not looking at the source of this uh, Twitter account. You're looking at the content, and you're cross-referencing that with threat intel sources. True. Um, probably there could be some enhancements where maybe at some point if we know a certain Twitter account to be uh, a troll, uh, that you could ignore them. It's actually a good suggestion. But currently, in my current implementation, I do it uh, with threat intel uh, based on the content. And so far, the results have been good. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyway, continuing. Uh, great questions. Thank you. Um, yeah. Again, these are mainly uh, threat intel uh, guys or, or uh, uh, ethical hackers or whatever you want to call them, security researchers, um, sharing their information. And this is like really, really fresh information, fresh IOCs, as I call them. Um, now, what I've done is I've created a um, Python script, um, and I'm using the Twitter API and the Twitter uh, actually uh, Python uh, module, and I'm also using uh, Threat Response a Python module, which is a um, a package for this CTIA um, uh, API, so this open source Threat Intel project that I was talking about, and this allows me to combine all of these different sources of Threat intel Intelligence as well as my local monitoring, all on the same data model, making it very easy to compare the two. Um, now, what I'm doing here is uh, doing this. Uh, so there's a concept of modules in CTIA. Uh, we don't have time to go completely in it. But basically, you integrate modules into this um, service. And every module is a source of information. It can be threat intelligence or uh, local monitoring systems. Basically, we're going through all of them. And we're seeing if any of them says the disposition is equals to one, which means it's clean. If that is the case, we're skipping it. So this is where in the code I'm skipping the false positives. Then I'm going on the lookout uh, specifically for sightings, as they're called, also sometimes called detections, with an actual target. Because sometimes you have a sighting which is just, yeah, I've seen it sometime, and um, but there's no actual target, means there's no host or device, it's, uh, then usually it doesn't mean anything. So this is also something where I'm um, minimizing the amount of false positives. 
Um, now, if we go and actually run this, decided to do a live demo, which may be smart or not, um, you'll see here on the bottom the script running. Let me pull it up a little bit. Um, and what it's doing now, it's pulling all uh, information from uh, Twitter, um, if my internet connection is working. And um, it will then, yeah, do all of this parsing. And um, let's see whether that works. And if it does find something, it will actually create that incident in an incident manager that I'm using. And it will also send a, a message uh, to, um, to your security operations center using a messaging app. I've chosen WebEx because I work with Cisco and it was easily accessible. Actually, I think they're based out of Norway, out of uh, Lee, Lee Sander or something. Um, well, you see here they uh, have a new tweet detected. Um, and now it's going to do that parsing. So it's going to f check. Um, all right, so what is in this tweet? Are there any IOCs? If there are any IOCs, what do my modules say about it? You can see here that there were sightings, which is called that, um, um, so it has been seen, but no targets were that. So it, what that means, if there's no targets, it wasn't seen on any uh, device. Um, we can scroll here further, and you can see that one actually did have a success, and we added a case to Casebook, which is an incident manager. Um, and as you can see, we've also sent this WebEx message. And again, um, we can see here what the original tweet was, and we can directly investigate it if we want. And this investigation, um, yeah, I'm doing that with a, a Cisco tool uh, based on this open source CTIA project. So this is basically just a UI on top of it. Um, so I could click on it. It would bring me to a um, investigation similarly like this, where I can directly see anything that was happened, which hosts were affected, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, and I'll stop this one from going. Um, and Again, I can quite easily run this script with a cron job or however you want to automate it, and it will just keep running every, whatever you say, every hour, for example, see if there's any new tweets and parse them and do the exact same trick. Okay. So um, this was our first use case um, with a, tw a demo from Twitter. Um, we're almost uh, nearing the end. I have um, uh, uh, one more use case, um, and I don't think I have time for the demo of this one, but I also have on my GitHub um, information on this and, and automations available. Um, just to recap, we talked now about uh, what threat hunting can do. Um, we know that this intelligence-driven threat hunt is the easiest one to do. You just saw how we can grab those intelligence from Twitter and use uh, a simple a script uh, uh, to, to, to do some threat hunting. Now let's see what actually happens when something is detected. You need to do instant response. Um, instant response, again, we can break that down into, um, into phases. But what you can see here compared to threat hunting, you can actually do a lot more automated. Um, Preparation is get prepared for a security event. Uh, you can't really automate that. That's really prepping your teams, making sure you have the right tools, you have access to the right information. Uh, that is something you usually don't automate. But validating the security event, containing the security event, uh, and uh, the recovery is usually something you can do. Eradication may be possible. This is usually re-imaging a host or something like that. Uh, usually you want uh, some kind of a senior um, instant responder involved when you do that. And finally, lessons learned. Uh, you can actually automate there as well, is generating a report on what you have learned. 
Um, now let's have a look at a phishing incident response use case. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, um, these were the steps that you'll take, but uh, I've written them down a little bit better here. Um, on the X axis, I guess, uh, you'll see a couple of different comp solutions that you could use uh, for this. And on the Y axis, you see those phases. Now suppose a new incident comes in. Um, well, the preparation is not something you really automate again, um, but uh, you do need to be prepared. So the first thing you do is you need to collect extra information. We saw just now how you can do that information collection. And you grab, for example, information from uh, security solutions. Then, based on whether it actually is or is not an incident, you go and contain the threat. So you send a notification to your team, you start blocking stuff. You can do that quite easily automated. And again, on my GitHub, you can see some examples. Uh, this could be as simple as blocking an IP address or blocking a domain or uh, quarantining a device from a network, uh, etc. Eradicating usually is, a, is, again, something a human is involved. Clean up the endpoint, clean up the mailbox, uh, and report your, the authorities um, is something usually you do in this stage. Finally, recovery. So we need to bring that system back online. You can do that quite easily automated. And your lessons learned, where you go and develop an incident report, send notifications out, and, um, for example, keep everything track in a third-party si ticketing system like ServiceNow. Now, be mindful here that this identification stage is very important here, because this is where the mistakes get, get made. If you accidentally mark something as an incident, this whole chain starts happening, even though it was a false positive, that's where you need to learn. And that's why if you have an incident manager, or a ticketing system, and there is a new incident, and if you identified it as a false positive, make sure you change the status to reject it or you stamp it as false positive, depending on what system you may be using. Um, make sure you do that and make sure your organization actually has some kind of a webhook set up that if this happens, that you actually learn from it and that whatever detection that caused this alert gets either tuned or muted. Okay, so um, we have a few minutes left. Um, I'll make some concluding remarks, um, and then uh, we're, uh, we're ready with our, our session today. Um, now, some conclusions here. Threat hunting is a continuous process and a loop. Whenever I see something like this, I think automation. Instant response is a sequential set of processes. So where threat hunting really is something you keep doing, in some response, you have these phases that you need to walk through, and you can't just uh, do that in a loop. That is really a sequential process. Now, for both of these crucial and very common security operation processes, you need to do tuning, and feedback is crucial. So if you do find a false positive, don't just throw it away. Uh, Take it to your advantage, make use of it. Now, there are many tools that can help you with it. Um, and um, yeah, I hope that you'll take a look at that open source project. Um, that's, uh, that's a good one. But obviously, there are a lot uh, more tools that can help you with it. So I hope that um, after this um, uh, session of <laughs> math, of s processes, of uh, of demos uh, that I hope that I've convinced you a little bit, if you weren't convinced already, that automation is mainly a enabler and not a weak link. And I hope that your glass is a uh, little bit more uh, full than half empty uh, currently. So with that, there's nothing left to do than uh, strike off the last item. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much.